one, two, three, four. Welcome. We're at the Portland neighborhood this morning. Now we're on the river walk. The river walk is a seven mile long asphalt jogging, bicycling, line skating path that starts down at the Belvedere Plaza and goes along the Louisville and Portland Canal, the Ohio River, and ends up at Chickasaw Park in the Shawnee neighborhood. We're up on the flood wall. Then a lot of earth moved. 29 mile long wall that goes from the Butchertown neighborhood all the way to Cosmetsdale in the southwest. And we're in the Portland neighborhood, a part of which, well, first, Portland neighborhood is in the far upper left-hand corner of the map of Louisville and Jefferson County. There are parts of Portland that are further north than parts of Jeffersonville, Indiana. There are several themes that I want us to keep in mind as we move through the Portland neighborhood. One theme is resilience. Another theme is vulnerability. These folks have been used to floods over the years. Another theme is ethnicity. A whole lot of different folks of shades, colors, and origins have peopled this place from the very earliest times. But probably the dominant theme in the Portland neighborhood is transportation. Think of the name. Now, I don't know French, I guarantee you, but my daughter does. And she tells me that porte means carry. Carry it on the land around the falls of the Ohio. Now, the falls of the Ohio are out beyond those trees there. And that's where the Ohio River drops 26 and a half feet to just two and a half miles, the only major natural obstruction to navigation in the 981 mile length of the Ohio River. So transportation has been integral to the whole history of this neighborhood. That canal, 1830, dug and blasted through limestone rock a two-mile ship's canal around the falls of the Ohio. These railroad tracks, this is the Panama Yard, the old Panama Yard that's associated with the Illinois Central Railroad, which was the Panama Line. They were the major carriers of bananas out of Panama into the central part of the United States. So rail has been part of the history of this community. And then in addition, that super highway over there, late 60s and early 70s, that's I-64. Transportation has been important to the history of this community. Over on your far left, thinking of transportation, that is the United States Marine Hospital. That painted white building was built in 1852. You know how that happened? Louisville prospered mightily with the coming of the steamboat to this community. It was our golden era. We grew in population, but we found out something. Steamboat captains are not in the welfare business. We found that if there was a sick or infirmed riverboat crew member, they would put them off at the next wharf. And the solution? is that 1852 United States Marine Hospital. Looking at that third floor balcony, it's not hard to imagine riverboat crew members in their last days watching the busy life here at the Louisville Portland Canal. But you know, that building is one of the 11 most endangered historic sites in the United States and is looking for a better future. We're in Lannan Park. Now, Lannan Park was built just in the early 1950s on the site of the old West End dump, and I don't mean landfill. It was named for Joseph Lannan, a Portland political leader who had actually served as head of the garbage department for the city of Louisville. And how ironic it is that the park named for Joe Lannan was literally on top of the old West End landfill. They did a lot of moving around of dirt when they were building, mounding up this flood wall. You can still see as the land goes lower toward the interstate highway, that's where Mile Long Pond was. It was a slough where there was standing water in the olden days. 
But transportation has been critical to the life of this community. In fact, here in the Riverwalk are the plates that have been set in the Riverwalk that talks just quickly about various boats that plied these waters, canoes, flatboats, keelboats, and on as we move along the river walk being reminded of transportation and how important it is in the life of this community. Now you figured out something I can tell. When that canal was cut in 1830, it turned that land over there where the trees are, which was formerly a peninsula, turned it into an island. That island is called Shipping Port Island. Now, Shipping Port was founded in 1806 by two brothers who were from France. They had been aristocrats, and they fled the confusions of revolutionary France in what became a community of 400 souls out on Shipping Port. Oh, there had been a few buildings and a little community that was barely a community called Campbellsburg, but Louis and John Tarascon from France came down here, bought land, and founded a town called Shipping Port. Those Tarascons had a dream that they were never able to realize. The dream was to create a river sailing vessel capable of shallow draft, but capable of navigating the Atlantic Ocean. Their dream was simple. Start at Pittsburgh. No, after 1806, start at Shipping Port with its wharf, facing downstream below the falls of the Ohio, and the dream was to load up these sailing vessels, sail down the Ohio to the Mississippi River, out the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to Europe without having to unload loads. That dream was never realized. But the Tarascons, the founders of Shipping Port, had another dream, and that was a dream they realized in 1819. They built a gigantic grist mill out at the tip of the peninsula, immediately adjacent to the falls of the Ohio. And they harnessed, by way of a spillway, the drop of the Ohio River at the falls of the Ohio to turn that mighty grist wheel. And so the Tarascon Mill was a six-story structure, a giant mill that was later in the 1840s converting not to grinding grain, but to grinding limestone rock for the making of a fine hydraulic cement. That mill was active out there on Shipping Port Island until it burned in 1892. So that's Lewis and John. Oh, forgot to tell you. Louisville Gas and Electric built that beige colored building far out there on the horizon. That is a hydro plant that again harnesses the drop of the falls behind a Z-shaped dam that makes a little less than 5% of our electricity, what's the name of the hydro plant? The Lewis and John Tarascon Hydroelectric Power Plant of the Louisville Gas and Electric Company. Ah, oh, we're in Maritime City. The call of the leadman on the front of those steamboats. I'll bet you you're gonna recognize one. Here's Half Twain, Quarter Twain, and Samuel Clements. Oh, I mean Mark Twain. And then, no bottom, that's what the captain wanted to hear best because the leadman had a heavy weight on a rope and he would be out on the front of that steamboat when waters were uncharted and unclear as to where the bottom was, dropping that lead weight down to the bottom. And when he called out from the front of the boat, no bottom, that's good news because there was no problem in navigating. Navigation, important to the history of this area. Now, you know I brought you here to talk about shipping port because this is the oldest part of Portland, 1806. Some other folks out on shipping port that you probably ought to know. Well, I'll tell you one. A man of French descent who was born in the Caribbean in Haiti. His dad was a businessman and a French military officer. His mother was his father's mistress, perhaps of African descent, Jean-Jacques Audubon. Oh, no, I mean John James Audubon, the famous American naturalist who lived on shipping port for a season. 
but was restless, terribly, terribly restless. And so he moved on to paint birds and, and wildlife in the emerging American West and to have those prints distributed in markets all around the world. He didn't live on shipping port for very long. But you know, in the 1820s, his wife and sons came back to shipping port to live with relatives, and they were marketing subscriptions to Audubon prints from shipping port all over the United States and even in parts of Europe. I'll tell you somebody else you ought to know from shipping port, and that's the Kentucky Giant. Jim Porter. Jim Porter was taller than any basketball player currently playing in the pros in America. He was, the claim, 7'9". Few people wanted to discount him an inch. Seven feet, eight inches tall. The Kentucky Giant. He lived on shipping port. He was first a barrel maker and then a taxi cab driver. They called it a hack in those days. And then he opened with his mama some taverns on both shipping port and further down in Portland proper. Charles Dickens was here and visited him. He came here, went to see Jim Porter. You know what he called him in American Notes, published from London the next year? He called him a lighthouse among lampposts. Jim Porter, oh, you're not going to believe this. Jim Porter was slow growing when he was in adolescence. And at 16 and 17 years old, he was still a little bitty old guy. And for a time, there was a racetrack, a thoroughbred racetrack about a mile behind us called Elm Tree Garden. This Kentucky giant in adolescence was a jockey up at Elm Tree Garden, which is just absolutely confounding. It's hard to believe. There was a fellow here working on this canal that I want you to meet. He came in 1827. There were thousands of men, black and white, American-born and immigrants, who were working on this massive public works project, a two-mile-long ship's canal, and one of the best known because he kept a daily journal, was a 16-year-old kid named Increase, Increase, Alan Lapham. He first was a grunt on a survey team that was surveying for the canal project. But this curious and capable kid who walked to school up in Louisville at Man Butler's Jefferson Seminary, which is a predecessor of the University of Louisville, he tells about this in his journal. But this curious kid ultimately became an engineer building, designing the 18th Street Bridge which connected the mainland to Shipping Port Island. Increase Alan Lapham, when he was just 17 years of age, he published a scientific treatise on the geological formations, the limestone fossil beds of the falls of the Ohio that was published nationally. Increase Alan Lapham is one key person who provides insight into the building of this canal. See that orange windsock and those chevrons? That leads to a 1,200-foot-long concrete bathtub called the William McAlpin Lock. William McAlpin, he was a civilian in the Army Corps of Engineers. That's a little unusual on either side of World War II. And McAlpin was a major leader in the U.S. Corps of Engineers in this area. They named the lock for him. If the river drops at Louisville 26 and a half feet, then the water in front of downtown is 26 and a half feet higher than the water at Shawnee Park around the bend of the river. And so, therefore, you got to get boats from up here to down there some way. You fill the bathtub up with 26 and a half feet of water. Just like an elevator, you lower the boat to the lower water below. This lock has, and this river, has a massively strong back. Do you know the standard toll on this river that comes through this lock 
is five barges deep and three barges wide. One tow pushed by one towboat carries the equivalent weight that would be carried by 900 semi-trailer trucks. Now, you see those big cranes out there, those massive cranes, and the trucks are moving. There is a 10-year renovation and modernization project going on at the McAlpin Lock here at the end of the Louisville and Portland Canal. The federal government is spending a third of a billion dollars over a 10-year period in modernizing the lock and building a second 1,200-foot concrete bathtub. See those giant structures out there? They're brand new. I asked the Corps of Engineers, I said, what in the world are those things? They create the framework for hanging lock gates. Because when a lock gate breaks or is damaged, it needs to be repaired very, very quickly. And that's one more way to keep the traffic moving on this big, River Highway, the Ohio River, and this canal and lock that comes right through here. Well, we're leaving the shipping port area of Portland. This is the oldest part. Now we're going to what's called Portland proper. Now that is a six by six town that was laid out in 1811, 1812. Remember, shipping port is 1806. Now think with me a minute. There are folks in this community that just glibly say, well, you know, Portland is older than Louisville. Portland is old, plenty old, but not older than Louisville. Louisville is 1778. Shipping port is 1806. Let's head for Portland proper. Now, the modern Louisville and Portland Canal doesn't look like that original of 1830. The original of 1830 was only 64 feet wide. Today's canal is 500 feet wide. And every time it's been widened, 1860s, 70s, again, I think in the 20s, and then certainly in the, in the 1960s, every time the canal has been widened, we have cut away at Shipping Port Island. In fact, we cut away on the downstream end of the island, and that's the part of the island where the densest population was. Let me tell you about the street names in Shipping Port, just to suggest what I mean, river commerce. At various times, the streets in Shipping Port were named China, Alabama, Florida, Hemp, Tobacco, St. Paul. Does that tell you something about river commerce? about a dream of a maritime community with a great big future. The other thing I want to tell you about that lock, that modern 1,200 foot long concrete bathtub, well, the first lock of 1830 at the end of the canal was a wooden lock, a series of three stair step locks that would lock you a little way down, drop you down to another basin, and then to another wooden basin to get you down the 26 and a half foot descent at that original 1830 lock. Now remember, we talk about transportation and here comes a train coming out of Louisville's second largest freight handling yard. It now belongs to Norfolk Southern. It's called the Bennett Youngstown Yard. Bennett Young was a railroad pioneer, an old veteran colonel on the Confederate side in the Civil War. But he, was, he dreamed of a rail link between Louisville and St. Louis and beyond. And so he created a bridge company to build a railroad bridge across the Ohio River. And then that bridge company became part of the Kentucky and Indiana Terminal Railroad. That was a local company with over 2,000 employees, and that freight handling yard here in West Louisville in the Portland Shawnee neighborhood 
That freight handling yard is the city's second largest. This old house served as the executive offices for the k and Railroad. But this old mansion one day had lawns that went all the way to the canal's edge long before the railroad track was here. The mansion was built by Enoch Lockhart. He was the superintendent of the Louisville and Portland Canal and the locks. Transportation history coming back one more time. And then after that, Lockhart's house was sold to James Irvin. James Irvin, he owned and ran the ferry boat that connected Portland across the Ohio River to New Albany in southern Indiana. So this is the Lockhart House that became the Irvin House and then became the corporate headquarters for the K&I Railway Company. Well, now we've popped out on Montgomery Street, which is leading to Northwestern Parkway. I'll tell you, this building over here on the left, that gives me an illustration of where in my own work Historical romance meets historical reality. For many years, I've walked along here and too easily deduced that this was an old tobacco warehouse. I guess because I saw what looked like, in my imagination, tobacco leaves above the door. But I spent several hours in old city directories and looking at other historical documents. You know what I concluded? This building was built in 1920 for Ed Harder, a garage. Ed Harder was here for a while, then there was a bakery in the 1920s. Greyhound buses were repaired here at one time, another automobile repair place. And then, after World War II, it was a storage facility for a Portland distillery. But then, in the 1950s, it was modern living furniture. In fact, around here on the side, you can still see the old sign from modern living furniture. This used to be a pretty, pretty busy intersection. That's why you can have a big modern sign like that. That's why Ed Harder would open a garage here in 1920. This was a busy intersection because right here on the right is the only place you could take a car, short of putting it on a ferry, to southern Indiana, to Indianapolis, Chicago, and beyond. This was the main doorway by automobile to the city of Louisville between 1912 and 1929. This was the entrance to the old K&I toll bridge. This bridge was built first in 1886. It had a wagon way suspended from that first bridge. And then they rebuilt the bridge in 1912. And when they rebuilt it, the automobile had come to town and they cantilevered two automobile lanes, one northbound, one southbound, off of the railroad bridge. So this is the old entrance, the old exit, I guess you would say, of the K&I Toll Bridge, built in this farm in 1912. Those toll booths charged you a dime. But you know what? In the 1970s, after they had already opened the free interstate highway bridge to New Albany, they still had this bridge open. And in the latter days, it was the honor system. You were just supposed to pull up in front of a bucket and throw your dime in. They closed it in the 19, late 1970s. Now, the characteristic of Portland proper is that the streets are extra wide, 99 feet wide, in fact. Why were they so wide? They were a surveyor's chain and one half. 99 feet wide, because the dreamers of this town in 1811-1812, it was a Cincinnati old veteran, Revolutionary War veteran by the name of William Lytle, and he dreamed of a privately financed canal. And so he thought by founding a town, he would sell off the lots to privately finance the canal. He laid out the streets extra wide, we believe, because he thought this town of Portland had a maritime future, and you'd need to be able to turn a team of oxen around in the middle of one of these wide, wide streets. We call it Portland proper.
because Portland proper is 1811, 1812. By 1818, Lytle had bought more land toward Louisville, and Louisville was growing toward Portland. Portland was growing toward Louisville in what was called the Portland Extension, the coming together of the two communities. But at first, Portland was a separate place, only connected by a turnpike from Louisville down to the town of Portland. One of the old brick streets in the town of Portland. But notice it ends abruptly at the flood wall. The reason it ends abruptly is because we abandoned four streets between the flood wall and the old historic wharf of the town of Portland. The busy wharf where steamboats landed, where were there the voices of stevedores and draymen moving goods. All of this was back toward the river. But before the flood wall of 1948 was here, this part of Portland was a little bit scruffy off to your right, underneath the bridge. In fact, twice a year, gypsy bands camped outside in tents here. There were shanty boat people, sometimes living on the river's edge and sometimes living on boats that were raised up on the mainland. There were a goodly number of African Americans scattered in this part of town, as well as many other parts of the old historic part of Portland. Now that's wide, wide Market Street, now called Rudd Avenue after a local politician. In fact, it is said that Vice President of the United States, Alvin Barkley, saved this part of Rudd Avenue. How did he do it? Well, the priest here at Our Lady Church on Rudd Avenue went to the Vice President and said, don't let us give up, have to give up our old historic Our Lady Church. And so they raised the flood wall high enough in order to save this part of Rudd Avenue. Used to be called Market Street. The most intense part of commercial maritime Portland historically is along the river's edge out at the old wharf. That's where Water Street was. Florida, it was called an alley, but in fact, it was mostly a street. Florida, Missouri, Missouri Alley, those four streets, very densely settled and very busy with maritime commerce, they were between the flood wall and the river's edge. We gave up those four streets when we built the flood wall, and now, the foundations of over 140 buildings, residences and commercial buildings are now under three feet of alluvial mud. And this, this is not gonna surprise you, this is now the Portland Wharf Archaeological Park. We are steadily over the last 20 years and intensifying the effort right now, doing archeological digs in that abandoned part of old Portland. In fact, we have recreated life on Water Street in a diorama. And the dream, huh, maybe it's a little grandiose, but the dream is to ultimately have an archeological park where young people can learn skills and actually participate in the ongoing process of discovering what's in and under the foundations of the old part of Portland that we have abandoned beyond the flood wall. The river walk descends off of the flood wall and heads out to the intersection of Commercial Street and Missouri Avenue. And they have recreated that intersection. That's where an archeological dig has been done on Commercial Street, now 34th, and Florida Alley, which is the second street back off of the old wharf. That's where Paul McQuare and his son-in-law, Paul Villiers, had the historic St. Charles Hotel. The folks who had come to Portland were French, yes, African-American, yes, and a whole lot of Germans and a goodly number of Irish, many of them Roman Catholics. And all of that life was out there on the Portland Wharf and the three other abandoned streets that are now underneath the alluvial mud. Downstream, straight ahead on, on your right, 
there would have been another distillery, the Rugby Distillery. And you know what the Rugby Distillery did, as many distilleries did? They had cattle sheds immediately adjoining the distillery, along about 37th Street, out toward the water's edge. What were the cattle doing next to a distillery? You already know. The residue, the mash residue of the whiskey-making business was fed directly into the cattle sheds for fattening of the animals for market. And so that was going on at the Mattingly Distillery or the Rugby Distillery or the several other distilleries that were here in the Portland neighborhood. Now that's what I mean by a wide, wide street just one of the 99 feet wide streets here in Portland proper. This is 33rd, we're headed now to 34th, which was called Commercial Street, which was the busiest part of the old town. Folks, we're gonna now descend off of the flood wall. I have never lost anyone before. I'll show you how we can do it. Kinda just do it one step at a time, take your time, take your time. You can't imagine the number of humans over the years that I've taken down off this wall, just this way. So let's don't run the record today. Now we've descended off the flood wall. I wanna show you the oldest house in town. Wouldn't surprise you a bit that as we leave the wharf, we would be headed uphill. We're literally headed up the riverbank. Down here on the corner is an old grocery store. It's the O'Bannon grocery store. The O'Bannon family from here in Portland had a grocery store here for many years. It was here in 1892. We believe the building that has now been converted into apartments dates from the late 1880s. Now, as we head up the steeper bank, toward what's historically called High Street. It's now called Northwestern Parkway. But why would you call it high? Because it's on the high bank of the Ohio River. And here, at the very peak of the hill, is the oldest house in Portland. Here is Jacob Eric's house. Now, at one time, John Rowan owned this house of Federal Hill, my old Kentucky home. He was an investor at a later time here in the town of Portland. We don't know how old the house is, the Squire Jacob Eric House. I think a, the term Squire, I wondered for a long time whether it was his first name, but in fact, it was a title. He was a member of the town aristocracy. He also served as the town magistrate or the justice of the peace. In fact, in his living room, he held court, at least arraignment of criminals, people who were charged, brought to his house, and they used his basement as a holdover before the prisoner could be shipped to the Jefferson County Jail in downtown Louisville. So this house, we believe, and I met with an archaeologist and talked with him about it, is Creole style, kind of out of New Orleans. It has beams that go from all the way back of the house to the second floor that's cantilevered over that postage stamp front porch. And that front porch served a commanding view of the busy life of the old town of Portland all the way down at the wharf where the steamboats and the draymen and the stevedores and the visitors gathered. The Squire Eric House is also part of an archeological dig. They're trying to trace the various additions and changes over time. It belongs to the Portland Museum, the neighborhood museum in this independent old town that was separate from Louisville. But this is the Squire Jacob Eric House. Where, how old is it? 1820s probably. We're not for sure, but we believe it is the oldest house still standing in town. And no doubt, one of the wealthiest men in town had the house on the hill with the commanding view of the wharf below. Come down at the corner, something I wanna show you. We think of curbings as coming from concrete trucks and curb stones as coming from quarries. Well, let me show you historic curb stones, 
how they were arranged and placed here down at the corner in order to build a gutter that served a storm sewer in today's world. But this is the old curb stone, didn't come out of a truck, but came out of a quarry. And here's the way they were fashioned to make this gutter system here in the old town of Portland. There used to be a streetcar that came down the street, but I'm telling you, the dream was bigger than a mere streetcar. The dream was Lexington's dream. You see, they had prospered as a stagecoach community, but the steamboat had come to town and they were determined at the earliest time possible to ride the steam locomotive to renewed prosperity. Here was the dream. They created in the early 1830s the Lexington and Ohio River Railroad. And they were determined to build a railroad from Lexington to Portland, Kentucky, bypassing the city of Louisville. Ah, but they had trouble financially. And they were dependent in the 1830s, 1837, for a bailout from Louisville commercial interest. Louisville bailed the Lexington, Ohio out all right with a deal. And the deal, the railroad had to come to Louisville and then to Portland. And the deal for Portland was that Portland would have to give up its town independence that it had had as an organized political entity since 1834. Portland had to agree to be annexed to Louisville and Louisville business interest would build the first leg, the western leg of the railroad from Louisville down to Portland, a steam railroad coming to the Portland Wharf right down this street. They built the railroad all right. Portland agreed to be annexed all right, 1837 into the town of Louisville and everything was going fine. The locomotive was on the rails, but Louisville Main Street merchants complained so loudly that the steam locomotive was scaring the animals and disrupting the peace that they got a court injunction that removed the steam locomotive off of this piece of the Lexington, Ohio that went from Louisville down to Portland right along the street. And so they replaced it with a harsh-drawn streetcar, the first streetcar in the community in the late 1830s. But by this time, Portland was so mad, they thought they had been gypped. They weren't getting the steam railroad that would terminate at their wharf here in Portland. They got so mad, in fact, that they went to the state legislature and in 1842 got themselves de annexed from the city of Louisville went independent again, and they were independent from 1842 to 1852. Ah, there is a measure of independence and resilience in this old town of Portland. Now, the old town has experienced flooding over the years, and many of the original buildings had been washed off of their foundations. I'm thinking of 1937 or 1945. So what you see on Rudd Avenue or Market Street today are some of the buildings that survived from that earlier day, but some of them are newer buildings that have replaced those buildings damaged by flood. But the Campbell House hasn't gone anywhere. We're not sure how old the Campbell House is. Uh, some people say the 1840s, some people say the 1870s. As Portlanders are wont to do, they usually like to have the house originally owned by a steamboat captain. And many of the elegant homes in Portland were indeed owned by steamboat captains. You know what I see about the Campbell house that I love? I don't know that even he was alive when the first door was opened. But old Jim Porter, the Kentucky giant, could have walked in the front door of this house. Also, look at that highly decorative porch on the parlor off to the side around the door to the parlor. That reminds you of the connection of this community to the French in New Orleans. And that connection is real. In fact, the New Orleans Catholics contributed to the building of the third Catholic church in Louisville, which was built right here on Rudd Avenue, formerly Market Street in the town of Portland. Ah, the old mooring rings from the wharf 
we just discovered another set of mooring rings in the archaeological dig from the old wharf, the old Portland Wharf. Now you see this building on the left. The Sisters of Loretto came to Portland in the 1840s and bought this hill and erected buildings that were part of an academy, a girls' finishing school. It was called the Academy of St. Benedict, but popularly known as the Cedar Grove Academy, a girls' finishing school. That building right there dates from 1860. That's the classroom administration building. This was a residential campus with a chapel, with a nun's residence, with a laundry, with dormitory facilities for the young women. All here between the 1840s and 1925. And here in a minute, we're going to walk up on the old campus and see what happened when the sisters took their bell out of the bell tower and took it down to West Broadway in the Dorhorfer Mansion, opened up a day high school called Loretta High School. How did it do? Opened up a day high school called Loretta High School there on West Broadway and abandoned the site. We'll see how it became in 1926 and 27, the Cedar Grove subdivision, a designer subdivision. But first, here's the Catholic Church, mass held in the early 1830s. This building, a part of it at least, built in 1839, Notre Dame du Port, Our Lady of Portland. The church was rebuilt in 1866. The walls were frail of that new construction, and they had to rebuild it again in the early 1870s. But the base of the tower survives from the original 1839 church, Notre Dame du Port, Our Lady of Portland, a reminder of the French Catholicism that was part of this community's history. When the sisters gave up a year-round residential academy and moved to the Day High School on West Broadway, an enterprising Louisville architect by the name of Otto Mock, he was later associated with the building of Freedom Hall in the 1950s. Otto Mock took the old campus and designed houses that belonged to a designer subdivision. Mock saved the 1860 Classroom Administration Building took the front door, which was over on 35th Street, and made it the back door and redesigned the interior door in Spanish motif. It now houses apartments. But this is the classroom administration building of 1860. He tore down the chapel. The nun's burying ground was here. He built new buildings as part of the designer subdivision. He incorporated the old nun's residence from the academy made it into an apartment. The gardener's house from the academy he redid in stucco and included that as part of the designer subdivision. And every house is unique in design but belongs to its neighbor. I delight in the fact that Otto Mach designed designer garages for Model T's. Now, look back at the church. In the great flood of 1937, the water would have been over my head in the church. Dry as a bone where we're standing right now. This high bank of the Ohio River was an island in the midst of a vast Louisville flood. Now we're emerging out of this two block by one block subdivision, the Cedar Grove subdivision, and emerging out onto lovely High Street. This is the high bank of the town, High Street, now Northwestern Parkway. And the lovely homes, many of them workers or mechanics cottages, they have been maintained and kept up well. Now behind me in the next block 
are some of the larger homes that belong to steamboat captains. They're scattered through the neighborhood and are part of the beautiful stretch of Northwestern Parkway that we see in the Portland neighborhood. Well, we're approaching 36th Street. It used to be called Ferry Street because this is the street that led to James Irvin's ferry that took folks from Portland over to New Albany. We're going to the very back side of town, and you know what's there, the town burying ground from the 1840s. It's called the Portland Cemetery, and it was burials at least 1840s, if not a little earlier. There are over 7,000 graves in the Portland Cemetery, and the cemetery was enlarged in the late 1970s and the 1980s, so there's plenty of room for additional burials. You know what? The cemetery is managed and owned by Louisville Metro Government, Department of Parks and Recreation. They maintain this cemetery as part of the deal. In 1851, when Portland, perhaps reluctantly, came back again to the city of Louisville for the second time, we agreed to maintain their cemetery in perpetuity as public burying ground. By the way, notice the mark of the stonemason who built this lovely entrance here to the Portland Cemetery. Come, let's look over the wall. This is the Portland Cemetery. Been buried here since the 1840s on the backside of this old town of Portland. This narrower street, which runs on the backside of town, was named for the Jefferson County Jailer in the early 1900s. He was a political leader, John R. Flanz, P-F-L-A-N-Z. The very last street, which is over beyond the cemetery, is called Bank Street. You know why? When William Lytle, the town proprietor and the seller and platter of the first lots here in the town, when he fell on hard times as part of the economic panic of 1819, his creditors foreclosed. John Rowan was one of the creditors and became a landowner in the area. And guess who else became a landowner? The United States Bank, the land that they acquired was over closer to the back side of town. And that's why that street is called Bank Street for the United States Bank. Well, we believe this simply elegant old home dates to the time of the Civil War. Belonged to Peter Portman, he was a town leader a town leader even during the time of independence between 1842 and 1852, owned a saloon, was a liquor dealer, and a civic leader as well. This house has been converted to several multifamily units, but the building is sound, and the old and new have come together. One of the most elegant homes in all of Portland is the Osborne House. The Osborne House, we think, dates from before the Civil War. There are many a person that says this is the oldest iron fence in Louisville, and boy, how in the world would you begin to prove it? I suspect these are tobacco leaves, an elegant fence in front of an elegant old home with its eyebrow lintels marking or delineating the windows. Notice in the front yard is the cornerstone of the old St. Peter's Anglican Church. It used to be across the street in the schoolyard. 
but the Osborne House is one of the more handsome houses in the oldest part of Portland. Now, boy, do I wish I knew the answer to the question that I'm going to pose for you. This is a modern school built around an old school. See the roof of the old school? The old Portland school was moved to this site from around the corner, the Portland Elementary School. That school opened in 1853. Does that tell you anything? Part of the deal for Portland coming back to the city of Louisville. And I'm almost sure that's the original 1853 building still popping out above the Jasper Ward designed envelope that circles the old school building. Now, I did see one source that said that that old school is really an 1890s version of the Portland Elementary School. But I am confident that the school was on this site, and I suspect it's the original 1853 Portland Elementary School building that's wrapped in this modern late 1960s envelope. The old and new brought together here in Portland. Now, Mr. Goodwin was a ship's carpenter before he was called to preach. And the Methodists sent him to this new church here on the corner. Well, Reverend Goodwin had good hands for working wood and doing construction. In fact, in 1860, just before the Civil War, Reverend Goodwin was the lead carpenter on building the church where he was the pastor. Later, a Greek revival, columns and all, modern front was put on the old Portland Methodist Church, which was later renamed the Parkway Methodist Church, United Methodist Church. But this is the old Methodist Church, the rear portion of which dates from before the Civil War. Now here along Northwestern Parkway, there is a mix of architectural styles, bungalows, Remember, we started our tour in the recreation of a Portland bungalow. You know, that very park pavilion where we started in Lanham Park was a recreation of a Portland bungalow. In that case, it was a camelback bungalow. So we have a mix of architectural styles from the Portland bungalow to the larger, more elegant homes on this part of Northwestern Parkway, Old High Street. All of this is part of the diverse architecture that's here in the Portland neighborhood. And here, that Scots-born industrialist, the American industrialist, Andrew Carnegie, teamed up with Louisville and many cities around the United States to build Carnegie Libraries. This Louisville Free Public Library here in Portland, 1912. And over on the other side of the street, does that remind you of anything? The old saloon that used to be on this corner has been replaced by the Toll Bridge Inn, which is a cafeteria and a restaurant. You remember the Toll Bridge that we saw not so long ago, the K&I Toll Bridge between New Albany and Louisville. Now look, something's going to happen at this intersection. Behind me is the turnpike of 1818. This is the turnpike, now called Portland Avenue, that connected the old city of Louisville with the town, with the wide, wide streets, the town of Portland. There's the turnpike coming down toward us from downtown Louisville. That's the turnpike that when Charles Dickens was here in, the, in a stagecoach on his way down to the Louisville-Portland Canal to meet the Portland Giants, you know what he said about the streets? Why, the road was perfectly alive with pigs of all ages lying about fast asleep or searching for tidbits among the ashes. This is the, the Louisville and Portland Turnpike that comes in right here to the wide, wide streets of the old town of Portland. Hiya. Fine, thank you. Now this is not an original brick sidewalk. We've seen some original brick streets. This is what I call a Harvey Sloan sidewalk. We began in the 1970s kind of rediscovering some of our older neighborhoods. And this is a modern, not so modern, 30 years old sidewalk 
that was part of neighborhood improvement in the early 1970s. The Baptist Church over here on the corner looks like a modern church, doesn't it? Portland Avenue Baptist Church. But you go around to the back side of the church and you see a church with 1858 written on it. They literally just put the modern church in front of the old church, another example of bringing old and new together here in the neighborhood. Well, folks, you've been troopers. There are a few themes that I think we've touched and that we can kind of look back on. There's transportation, everything from canals to riverboat captains, to railroad yards, to the building of the Lexington and Ohio that caused so much political trouble here in Portland. All of this is part of that Portland transportation history. Even I-64 with its exits, the two exits in the Portland neighborhood are part of the modern transportation history of this neighborhood. But there are other themes. Independence doesn't surprise you, does it? In fact, at a Portland festival here in this neighborhood to this day, they still symbolically elect a mayor of the town of Portland. First weekend in June every year. But more than independence, this town has resilience. This town has been vulnerable to flooding and has then been even forced to cut itself off from its closest to the river commercial past under alluvial mud and retreat behind the flood wall. This town has its own newspaper, monthly Portland Anchor. This town has its own museum. So it's independence and it's resilience, but it's also diversity. It's architectural diversity and it's ethnic diversity. We've seen Chinese gravestones. We've seen African-American institutions and residents. We've seen the French who peopled this area in the earliest days as well as the Germans and Irish that came to this place as well. This strong, resilient neighborhood has been hanging on to maritime commerce and to transportation for a long, long time. And the name, remember, Portland. From the French, we believe, to carry it on the land around the falls of the Ohio. Thanks for joining me on this walking tour of the oldest part of Portland shipping port and the old town of Portland that's not quite as old, you understand, as the city of Louisville. Thank you very much.